welcome to another edition of Military in Hawaii. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And for those of you who hadn't seen the program before, here we talk about what's happening with the military and veterans community. And uh, we're trying to provide information that's definitely going to, you know, it's going to be um, important to you. Uh, we're trying to touch on some subjects that um, some people don't seem to want to touch, but uh, I think it's really important that we get into certain issues. One of the, the issues we're going to be talking about today are the DD-214s. Um, I think George Washington was the one that said that a country is judged by the way it uh, treats its veterans. And uh, there's this issue about the DD-214s. A lot of people believe that when you get out of the military, if you have an honorable, clue, an honorable discharge, that uh, this is going to be the key to the future. But unfortunately, what it seems is that there are certain coding systems that's involved with the 214s that many veterans are not aware of that could have had a major impact on their lives and their family. And today, we're going to be talking with uh, Mr. Uh, Gary Port, who is out of uh, Long Island, New York, an attorney. And he's very versed in the subject. And what I wanted to do was bring somebody on that really knew what was going on that could explain what's happening. And Mr. Port, thank you for joining us on the program. Hi. Well, happy to be here. Anything I can do to try to uh, get some information out there about uh, how the 214s work is, is important. A lot of our people don't get it. A lot of JAGs don't get it. And uh, a lot of service members are really badly screwed over by this lack of information. Right. I'll tell you, with your background, I know besides being an attorney, you, you're a veteran yourself, I understand. Oh, uh, well, I, uh, I'm a retired uh, judge advocate. I was on active duty. Uh, commissioned December 23rd, 1986, Officer Judge Advocate Basic Course, 112th Basic Course. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of my classmates went on to become the Judge Advocate General, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Darpino. I only ended up as a mere Lieutenant Colonel. Mm -hmm. uh, active in reserve for 28 years. I retired January 1st, 2015. Mm -hmm. My last assignment, I was a Staff Judge Advocate of the 78th Training Division. Um, so on the military side, I've, I've been... Uh, been a JAG my entire career, been involved heavily with the law, and because of my JAG background, a lot of folks come to me in my private practice who are military or veterans, and as a result of that, I've learned a lot of stuff about the military that I didn't learn as a JAG, right. um, which the 214 is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. I went to the JAG school for 10 weeks when I was first commissioned. I was a defense attorney for three years. I have been, as I said, a staff judge advocate, an advisor to generals. Didn't know a thing about the 214s until about 15 years ago, people started coming to my office to hire me to do discharge upgrades. Yeah. And that's when I started to learn um, the, the fact that these 214s can be uh, very prejudicial and have a devastating impact on people's lives when they're trying to get jobs after they get out of uh, off active duty. Right. These codes... Uh that are on there. I mean, this goes way back. I mean, Vietnam era, and does it go possibly beyond that? Because I think. Oh yeah. I mean, the, the whole point is, and it, it, there's nothing initially nefarious about it. Basically, it's, it's the military is getting rid of you, uh -huh. and they want to have a reason for why they're getting rid of you. So if you try to walk back into a recruiter or go to a, a sister service, they know why you left, and they're not going to let you back in, or they are going to let you go back in. Right. We need to know why we kicked you out. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have. And by the way, if you, the Army regulation governing these, these uh, uh, separation codes is not a public document. When I was a JAG, I had access to this regulation. I could go to the Army uh, the website, but I'd have to uh, log in with my uh, common access card, and then I could get the regulation. Now if I try to get my hands on it, I can't uh -huh. because this isn't supposed to be a public document. Uh -huh. But the reality is everyone knows what these codes are. If you go on Google and search for the codes, you'll find all this information. Right. So what should be and was intended to be internal to the Department of Defense has gotten out into the civilian world and has a negative impact. So you can get a 214 where they kick you out with a general discharge under honorable conditions mm -hmm. or even an honorable discharge, but it has a negative code in there saying drug use or personality disorder or right. fraudulent enlistment. Or I saw stuff from the, uh, the Vietnam era, bedwetting, mm -hmm. um, homosexuality. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of codes. There are literally hundreds of these things. Yeah. Um, I mean, could you imagine some guy, who Vietnam era veteran, coming back with a, a 214 that says bedwetting? Mm. 
Yeah. That, that's, 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 that's horrible. Or you get a, a 214 that says personality disorder. Right. Uh, well, the thing, I'm thinking like so I'm Vietnam era myself. So the thing is, like I so said, we've of course been hearing about uh, the, the stereotypical negative impact of anyone who served in Vietnam or during that time is that they have some kind of problems. Uh, the, the unemployment rate among vet, I mean, veterans from the Vietnam era, is that extremely high? And is there a correlation between um, you know, these codes and, I mean, their, and the civilian lives, how it impacted them? Well, you have to keep in mind, there's a lot of things that went on with the, with the Vietnam era veterans, and it has to do a lot of stuff with what we now call PTSD. Right. We called it in World War I shell shock. It was battle fatigue in World War II. Uh, we... In Vietnam, there was another name, and then they finally in the 80s started saying, well, we're going to call post-traumatic stress syndrome. And it's only in like the last three or four years mm -hmm. that the military has taken a, a serious look at that. So that's a separate issue. Why, did, why was there a high rate of unemployment? Well, there's a lot of PTSD that was being undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, then you had folks who got bad paper. It was a lot easier to get bad paper in Vietnam than it was uh, 10, 15, or 20 years later because they had more um, uh, safety mechanisms in. Yeah. But yeah. bad paper is, is still easy to get. Mm -hmm. So you would get a guy who may have done nothing wrong other than was late for work, um, he didn't get along with his commander, mm -hmm. and they gave him a general discharge or a discharge under other than honorable conditions. Right. Well, now you've got this 214, general discharge or, or discharge under honorable, other than honorable conditions, and now you're going to try to get a job with this. Mm -hmm. Now, most employers are going to be a little wary of an other than honorable discharge. Right. But then it goes a little deeper because the bigger employers really know how to read these things. Mm -hmm. So if you get um, a 214 that has a reenlistment code of RE4, mm -hmm. but you have an honorable discharge, well, honorable discharge is great, but an RE4 means you are not allowed back in. Right. Well, if I've got an RE4 guy sitting in front of me, I know something bad happened to him in the military, and the military has banned him from ever coming back. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little wary. So even an honorable discharge with an RE4 code can make a guy radioactive. Right. So the, the, at least the Army, and I will give the Army big credit for this, mm -hmm. after the, the Vietnam era, the Army came up with a separate branch within the JAG Corps of defense attorneys. Mm -hmm. So everyone who gets accused of some misconduct in the Army gets to a free military attorney. The other branches don't do that right. like the Army does. Uh -huh. So it's still easier to get bad paper if you're in the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. Uh, you can still get bad paper in the Army, but you have a lot more safeguards because you've got the Trial Defense Service there standing watch. Right. So, but in the Vietnam era, you didn't have even the Trial Defense Service for the Army. Mm -hmm. And even now... Even now, we see situations where Marines, sailors, uh, airmen, and even and to some extent the Army, guys are being told, look, if you sign this piece of paper, we'll get you out within two weeks. If you don't sign it, you're going to be around for a long time. You could end up going to jail. Just sign here and go. Right. And we get guys signing and getting other than honorable discharges when they would have never gotten it mm -hmm. uh, if they had gone through the, the right process. To get an other than honorable discharge, they either have to give you a board or you've got to agree to it. Mm. If you agree to it, you get the other than honorable discharge. If you go to a board, mm -hmm. there's a chance that you might win. Right. Well, with these codes, if they go, how does this, does this have an impact when they go for veterans' benefits, things of that nature? Oh, oh absolutely. And this, is, this has been a big issue. Let's talk about, let's talk about again, w w if, if you have an other than honorable discharge, and let's, let's go back to that one, because maybe I should take a step back, because even veterans don't really understand all the di discharges out there, because there's many different layers here. You've got it, the administrative discharges. Mm -hmm. That's the honorable discharge, the general discharge under honorable conditions, and the other than honorable discharge. Those are the administrative ones. Right. There's one other one hanging out there called the entry-level separation. Mm -hmm. That's for folks who don't make it too basic. Mm. Then you've got the punitive discharges. You've got the bad conduct discharge, and you've got the dishonorable. You can only get those if you go to a court-martial, get convicted, and the court-martial sentences, sentences you to either a bad conduct discharge or a dishonorable discharge. Right. So those are the levels of discharge. Hmm. Now, on your DD-214, it states your level of discharge, 
it states the narrative, the reason for the discharge. Mm -hmm. It has a separation code, which is a three-letter uh, code, and it's got a, uh, a numerical code. Right. Now, you put all those pieces together, and it's going to have some devastating impact. The other than honorable discharge, in and of itself, bars you from many uh, be veterans' benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a brand new uh, secretary of the um, VA who has said, oh, we're going to make sure that folks who have PTSD and TBI are not denied veterans' benefits even if they get an OTH. Right. That's already in the regulation, mm -hmm. but it's not being followed because here's how that works. If you have an OTH, you now have to go to the VA and prove that your service was not dishonorable. Right. Well, if you got kicked out for drug use, they're going to say your service was dishonorable. Mm -hmm. But if your drug use, which, by the way, is going to be on your 214, mm -hmm. you know, it may say drug use. So now you've got an OTH, right. drug use, mm -hmm. and that's what your spin code is saying. Right. But you've got a purple heart, and the reason that you were doing drugs is you have PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. They didn't treat you. Mm -hmm. You end up self-medicating with, with yep. uh, marijuana or cocaine or ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Now you've got an OTH and a, 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 um, a, a narrative of drug use, and you're going to be denied, denied treatment at the VA for the PTSD and the TBI. Right. And by the way, I'm not making this one up. This is an actual case that I did with my uh, – I, I teach a, uh, a law clinic at the hospital law school mm -hmm. where we provide free legal benefits to veterans who have these problems. And we had a Marine. First week he was in Iraq, he was blown up by an IED, mm -hmm. traumatic brain injury, punctured eardrum. Right. He was diagnosed with TBI, traumatic brain injury, and the PTSD. Mm -hmm. They send him back to duty within a week. Yeah. He spends the rest of his tour there. At the end of his tour, there's only four people left alive in his squad. Yeah. Only four. He's one of them. He gets sent back to the States, again diagnosed with PTSD and TBI. Mm -hmm. They give him no treatment. He then goes out with some senior NCOs who are also suffering from PTSD. Right. They all party. He pops out on a, on a urine test, mm -hmm. and the Marine Corps kicks him out with an OTH. Now, they, don't, they tell him, sign here and go, and we'll get you right out. Yeah. So he doesn't go for a board. He signs for an OTH. So here we've got a guy with we've got a purple heart, PTSD, TBI, and no veterans' benefits. Yeah. We took that to the uh, Navy Marine Board of Correctional Military Records, mm -hmm. and wonder of wonders, they did give him an upgrade to an honorable discharge. Right. But rather than put down what I wanted, which was – expiration term of service, they basically put down, you know, at the discretion of the board, there was a special language that they put on there. Right. So his 214 says honorable, he gets the benefits of the VA, but someone who knows how to read a 214 is going to look at that and say, oh, he got this upgraded by the board, something must have happened. Yeah. You know, so know. E even then, they had to give him that little dig at the, uh, at the end. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, it's, uh Gary, we're going to take a short break, uh, but then okay. we'll come back and continue, and continue the conversation. But you're here on Military in, uh, military in Hawaii, and um, yeah, stay tuned, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here, and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen. One. Okay, and we're back, and again, my name is Calvin, and this is Mr. Gary Port, who's calling him from uh, Long Island, New York. And again, our subject today is uh, secret codes on DD-214s. Um, and I apologize first. May I call you Gary? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, Gary, like I say, this, with this, I know that uh, I came across the information by, totally by accident. And, uh, but I found out that there's a lot of uh, individuals who have uh, 
they either took it to court or trying to you know get it out there to the public but the mainstream press is not picking up on it and on top of that with some of the organizations the veterans organizations i talked to i was a little bit surprised at the lack of interest that they showed you know and do you see that or is there some i'm still trying to figure it out am i missing well, something well, there's there's three parts but there's the press uh, there's the the, uh, the politicians and then there's the vsos <clears throat> and the problem is rather than you know some sort of dark conspiracy i think it's because people just don't understand it uh -huh. there's so many people who have not been in the military that when they hear these kind of things they get a deer in the headlights look <clears throat> and as a result it's just easier to ignore the whole thing uh -huh. But I think, to me, it seemed like, okay, if the veterans are being shortchanged because they're being bounced out or, you know, discharged and they're not getting any benefits, then this comes back to have an impact on the local communities because if they're not getting help in any other way, then isn't this sort of a drain on some of the resources that's out in the civilian side? Well, of course it does, but it's so much easier to ignore the problem because, look, uh -huh. there's, a, there's a financial stake in this from the federal government. Yeah. When you give these people benefits, it costs the feds money. Right. If you now retroactively wave the magic wand and give these people benefits, mm -hmm. it's because it isn't just the um, the VA benefits. It may also be the uh, the GI Bill. If right. you get a general discharge, you lose your GI Bill benefits. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of money riding on that. And in fact, um, to give you an example. When they, uh, they waved the magic wand and said it's okay for homosexuals to serve in the military, mm -hmm. they did not retroactively fix all the discharges for the couple of generations of folks still alive who got kicked out for being homosexual. Right. And why? Because if they, if they then said we're going to make it retroactive, all these folks would then be stepping up and saying, I want my benefits. Mm -hmm. It's cost too much money, so we're not going to do it. Right. So it's all about money, basically. It's, it's, it's a money issue. I mean, yeah. in my personal opinion, it's a money issue. Uh -huh. I think it's just a lot easier to screw over a veteran and save money uh -huh. because while we do have the VSOs uh, out there doing a good job and, um, you know, folks like AUSA, MOAA, American Legion, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and all these other great service organizations, um, they're not as loud as some of the other organizations out there. Uh -huh. And so because we're not as loud, it's a lot easier to ignore us. Politicians will love to march with us on, on Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Oh, they're always out there with us on those days. You ever notice that, guys? Oh, yeah. They're there taking pictures with, with us, and they're patting us on the back, and they think it's all great. But when the time comes, whether they're Republican or Democrat, you know, to vote for things that we need, mm -hmm. They're not there. Many of them are AWOL. Yeah. Yep. I see. Yeah, they, yeah, just like they want <clears throat> the FaceTime and the camera time, now one of those things. But one of the things, like with the codes, if there's somebody that, uh, let's fast forward, let's like, say to today, anyhow, how much of the, uh, how much of these codings is being used as definitely having a negative impact on the current uh, veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq? Is there any way that they, if they do have these codings, and is there any way that they can correct it to find out, you know, you know, to get it off the record or whatever? Well, well first off, you're asking, is, has anyone done any sort of study on this? And the answer is no. Uh -huh. You and I are just sort of spitballing on this based on what we've heard anecdotally. Yeah. I am a, I'm, I'm part of um, a listserv with a bunch of other law professors who run clinics throughout the country. Great folks at William & Mary set this up. And... Mm -hmm. What I find fascinating is how much information is not out there. Very bright uh, law professors and practitioners like myself are asking questions which are very basic and none of us know the answer on because no one's got the information out there. Yeah. And this is a great question. What impact do these codes have on people's ability to get, um, uh, get employed? Yeah. I, mean, I, I just saw recently a really great paper just on the OTHs. Mm -hmm. which uh, was just published in a uh, law journal. And all of us on the list server are like, wow, you know, uh, uh, Professor Karen, Marcy Karen from um, uh, uh, the, uh, she's professor of law and the Jack and Lovell uh, Orlando Director for Legislative uh, Clinic at the University of the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. She just put out a great piece in the Case Western uh, Law Review 
uh, talking about other than honorable discrimination. Mm -hmm. And this is the first piece that I have ever seen. And she's trying to pull together all these numbers talking about how just the OTHs have created a massive problem with, with employment discrimination. Really? Oh. And this is like the first piece I've ever seen. This is a great piece. Uh -huh. So no one is doing the work out there. We're, 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 there's no studies. There's no governmental studies. We're pulling information from public sources, trying to get this information, and mm -hmm. trying to understand what's going on with all these veterans' issues. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, there are so many other problems out there that it seems to have all wonderful studies on but this this issue on what these discharges do and how their impact is upon our veterans mm -hmm. seems to be ignored because no one either cares about it yeah. or they're just so flummoxed by the whole concept that they're afraid to look into it yeah uh what well, with the course with this issue this goes the whole gamut uh, uh <clears throat> excuse me a list of personnel officers um this covers Everybody, as far as anybody who served in the military, right, has an, could have an impact. Well, well, well I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something. My, my son, who's uh, serving in Korea right now, told me a couple of lieutenants missed curfew, uh -huh. okay, mm -hmm. and because uh, one was drunk and the other one was trying to, you know, didn't want to leave him alone to miss curfew. They, they kicked both these two kids. All right, the second lieutenant, so they're probably all of 23 or 24 years old. Right. They just got the boot because of missing curfew. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it's going to... Officers too. So they're going to get a 214 that's going to have some really negative stuff on it about. And what did, what was it that happened? A 23 year old kid who's in Korea missed curfew because he went out drinking, and the other buddy stayed with him so that uh, he wouldn't be left alone. Yeah. And now you get a bad 214 over that. Yeah. Well, I know. I, I talked to a lot of uh, the veterans over here in active duty people, and it seemed like with the different uh, syndromes that they come up with. Uh, I think earlier you mentioned about the immature personality development, uh, all kind of things. You know, like say, it seems no matter where you go, it's like a minefield where if you just look the wrong way, there goes your career, you know, and there goes your benefits. And, and it could be you, you just meet up with the wrong person. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's very easy if the wrong people are in your chain of command because at the end of the day, there is no standard. Yeah, there's regulations, but there's no standard. I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a situation where when I was in SJA, we had a, a senior NCO go off on a, on a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to my desk as the JAG, I could have just said, fine, you know what? We're, we're going to process the, uh, the NCO for, for elimination because he was disrespectful to an, a senior officer. Right. But something didn't sit right with me, so I sent him to mental hygiene and turned out that he had PTSD. Uh -huh. So we sent him off for, for mental treatment because I had a good general who listened to me, and I didn't feel it was right just to automatically screw off a senior NCO. Mm -hmm. But you, you don't get that all the time. Right. So you get a situation where you have people who don't want to deal with the personnel issues, I've got too much to deal with. I've got the mission to deal with. I've got to deal with my personnel issues. I've got to make sure that everyone's MOSQ. I've got to make sure all this stuff's happening. And you, Sarge, you're part of my problem right now. I don't have time to deal with you. I don't care that you have a problem with your wife. I don't care that you're a combat veteran. I'm making you go away because you're an interference to my mission. Yeah. I know. I think it's, it's a major ripple effect. Because I see, we see the reflection in what in suicides, not only with the active duty. Exactly. But also, let's exactly. Say, with the veterans. That's another issue. And I went to so many briefings back in the uh, during the war. You know, where I would, as the JAG, I would go to all these briefings, and they would talk about we've just went up to the Pentagon and we had all this stuff. And in fact, when you have a suicide, I was involved in two suicide investigations. Uh -huh. That gets briefed to the vice chief of 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 the of the. Uh, of the um, I'm forgetting the, uh, the title now, but um, I was in the reserves, and I, I, my boss had to brief OCAR, the office of the uh, commander of the Army Reserves, who then had to brief above. So mm -hmm. I'm communicating with the SJA of the CAR to make sure that when they brief up at the Pentagon, because everyone gets all torqued up on the suicide. But yeah. you're right, it starts down at that, that company level. Right. Okay. So you're telling the company commander, you've got to make sure that you're doing soldier care, but we also have to make sure that you're doing the mission and make sure that everyone is qualified and you're able to uh, go off to the sandbox. 
So you got this poor captain who's now stressed between going off here and taking care of Snuffy, who's not up to speed. Well, I'm going to get rid of Snuffy because he's keeping me back on my mission. Mm -hmm. Then Snuffy commits suicide because no one took care of him. All right. Yeah. Yeah, something you mentioned earlier about, you know, like over-medication, because some of the things with, that are not being treated seems like they're being pushed out there, you know, multiple tours and everything else. And it's like a catch-22. If you go for help, whatever it is, then they find a way of saying, okay, well, you're not mission ready, so therefore we're going to get rid of you. If you've been in a position in the military where you've been in, for example, 10, 13 years, whatever, and you have the opposite, I mean, you have the, you're facing the possibility of being discharged for whatever reason, and or either if you have a family and you need to take care of them, you know, you're just going to go ahead, like saying, take the medication and uh, hope for the best, you know. And well, you, you're right. You suck it up and you move on. Yeah. You know, I, the, over here, like say personally, I like say I've talked to a number of troops, and a lot of them are. Uh, one guy in particular, I'll, I'll be real brief about with this. Uh, he had mentioned like he's been there, got the uh, went through everything else, and he came back. And uh, he was having so many problems with his wife, family, everything else. And he told me, like, oh, one time we talked, I was like, uh, I'm, I volunteered to go back over, but I know I'm not coming back. And I said, well, we got a premonition or whatever. And it was like, no. He says, well, I came back, you know, and I'm going through all these issues, and I'm not getting the help I need, you know. So if I go back, at least I can choose the time I dem my, my demise where when, it, it, when my time comes, at least my family's going to get insurance. They're going to be taken care of. I'll be viewed as, you know, uh, doing a service to my country, something like that, you know. Never seen the gentleman again, anyhow. But that's just one, you know, one of the stories that I'm personally familiar with, you know, where the lack of support, you know, when you have people out there that they feel that they have nobody that's looking out for them, you know, and they feel like you're backed into a corner. What are you going to do, you know? And again, well, and exactly, and there is no real, I mean, sure, the military gives a lot of lip service to this, but at the end of the day, you put too much pressure on the command to say you've got to get the mission done. So the commander now has the choice yeah. of taking care of the mission or taking care of the service member. Yeah. Well, he's looking at his officer evaluation report. He's looking at what his lieutenant colonel is telling him or what his colonel is telling him. Mm -hmm. He's going to take the mission first. Yeah. It's, the tone is set by the senior officers down to the junior officers. And if the senior officers are saying mission, 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 then the junior officers are saying mission, mission, mission. Yeah, they're losing the point. Okay, Gary, we're getting down to the wire. Anyhow, like I say, this, there's so much more that we can talk about this, and I hope we can do a follow-up program because I really believe, and I, I, I know your sincerity about uh, making sure this issue is addressed. But uh, I think we got about two minutes left. But is there anything, that, any high points that you want to touch on before we uh, end the, the interview? Well, the, there's just so much on it, and I think the, the thing that we really need to do is, one, we as veterans really need to make sure that we hold the feet to the fire to uh, the politicians. And okay. uh, look, I'm a Democrat, but I, that doesn't mean anything when it comes to the veterans' issues. Right. Democrats and Republicans equally will cross the aisle and in a bipartisan method screw the veterans every time. Yeah. Okay? It is not a Democrat or Republic issue. It is a veteran issue. And we have got to hold politicians, regardless of their political stripe, up to that high standard that they, they want us to believe that they hold. Right. This nonsense of them always showing up at the American Legion Hall, always showing up at the parades for the friggin' photographs, and then turning around and screwing us has got to stop. Yeah. We've got to hold them accountable. And for every, you know, and, and we have very few veterans who are serving in Congress. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that are there, you got to, are they doing it for the right reasons or not? For every Tammy Duckworth who is, you know, who lost both legs and is probably one of the best people out there for us, there's a couple of other guys out there who are running, and veterans who are running for the wrong reasons. Right. So merely being a veteran is not going to give them a pass at a politician. A politician is a politician, and we've got to hold them accountable for what happens to our people. Because at the end of the day, the reality is only... Only veterans are going to watch out for veterans. There you go. Okay, Gary, like I say, we got to go anyhow, but I appreciate the time. Like I say, I, we'll, we'll talk offline anyhow, but I'd really like to do a follow-up. Uh, you've been a wealth of information, and I'm pretty sure it has been very instructive to a lot of veterans out there. But, um, again, thank you. Keep up the good work. And uh, I, as a veteran, you know, thank you for your service and also what you're doing. Hey, I, I'm not a hero. I just represent heroes. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Okay, we'll talk anyhow, but I uh, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us today. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alrighty, bye.
Okay, we're about ready to wrap it up anyhow, but uh, we're always looking for feedback. Contact us here, contact me, and uh, we'll take it from there, but we will do a follow-up on this. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in, joining, and uh, we'll take it from there.